Welcome to another Thursday with Third Path webinar. We're so glad you guys are here. We have a very exciting topic for today. We're looking at the concept of courageous conversations that we need to have at the workplace in order to promote more flexibility. And you'll see that I've handpicked today's speakers because I know them very well. And as a result, we can have a more in-depth discussion about this very important topic. We hope what you learned today is that yes, flexibility can happen. You can make it happen today. And when we take that courageous step to put flexibility in place in our own lives, we're actually paving the way for others to follow in our footsteps. So we hope today's uh, stories about courageous conversations inspires you to make change and shows you that when you do this, not only is it good for you, it's also really good for your organization. Today you'll be hearing from Kate Mundy to begin with. She is an artist, but also uh, the marketing liaison and training coordinator at a medium-sized civil engineering firm. Michelle Hickox, who happens to be a Third Path board member, um, is the CFO of Independent Bank. And two of Michelle's colleagues, a treasurer, Amy Fagan, um, and the Director of Financial Reporting, Leslie Besada. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're here, and I really appreciate the focus of our conversation today and know that each of you have so much to contribute to this thought-provoking call. So let me put up Kate's picture, and we're going to hear a little bit about Kate and how she has around organized flex in her life. And Kate, take your time telling your story because... Your story has a very important um, beginning, middle, and where you are today. You've had some things happen in your life that really motivated you to make some changes and find courage. So we want to hear your story. How have you set up your life, and, and what, what were the series of events that brought you to setting it up that way? All right, thank you, Jessica. Um, so I, I was an artist for years, and I taught. Um, I was an educator, and then reached a the point where I needed – we needed health insurance, um, <laughs> so I went to the corporate world. Um, I've been married for uh, 18 years now, um, but so I went to the corporate world about 11 years ago. Um, I really love my job. Um, we're doing sort of administrative tasks, uh, marketing tasks, um, and more recently it's been training uh, coordinator uh, tasks. So I, the company I work for is a very, it's a work first culture. It's male dominated and most of the men, um, when I first started working there, most of the men, their wives, as soon as they had kids, quit their jobs and stayed home. Um, I had a, my boss was a very old school um, military um, guy and um, I, when, when I first found out I was pregnant with my son, I have two kids, a seven year old and a six year old. Um, he, but for sure, as soon as I had the baby, I was going to quit. Um, but that wasn't something that my husband and I uh, felt like we could do. And um, so he was very good about um, it was kind of some, the conversations were a little bit awkward to talk about, sort of asking him what I wanted. But we were able to sort of work through um, coming up with a schedule and a way of working so that I could have some. Um, I worked part time for a while after my first son was born. I'll, I'll, I'll go back by saying before I even had kids, um, he was doing one of my annual reviews, um, and he asked me something about like, is there something that the company could do to make to make my job better or make my aspects or aspects of working there better? And I said to him like, oh no, I'm perfectly happy. It's fine. And he said, he, you know, right then he stopped the interview and he said, never say that to your boss. He said, always ask for something. <laughs> so I felt like, like later that kind of gave me permission once, um, you know, once I had kids. So I came back to work after my first child. It was a part-time schedule, but it still was like a very nine to five. Um, you know, I, I would come in, work um, like three days a week, uh, but, I, and I, but I didn't remove any tasks. I just started doing like my 40-hour work week into um, about 30, 30 hours. Um, so it just was a crunch morning. I never took lunch breaks, that kind of thing. And then I found out my children are very close 
in age. I found out I was pregnant again. It was a huge surprise for us. Um, I was actually halfway through my pregnancy when I found out. I just thought I was, you know, getting a little weak of snacking. <laughs> um, so it was one of those things I was totally not prepared for baby number two and, um, and having to have the, another conversation about schedule. And I felt like I kept having to ask, you know, for changes. Like things weren't quite working out well. And after my second child, trying to balance the, the schedules for the kids, the workload, um, and I kept feeling like we were sort of having to do all these little adjustments where I would ask, and a few months later I'd have to ask again. Um, and then during that time, my boss retired, and I got a new boss who wanted me to focus on some different aspects at the job, so some of my some of the schedule needed to change a little bit, and some of the way I worked needed to change a little bit. Um, and at one point, I was doing four 10-hour days. And my boss was like, he's like, this is not working. Like, he's like, you're burned out, you're tired. I did that for three years. He's like, you're burned out, you're tired. Um, we, you just need to come back the regular five days a week kind of thing. Um, but then I was struggling with, um, by that point, I had a kid in elementary school. And I was struggling with um, elementary school schedules, you know, not having uh, school on certain days, um, holidays, things like that. And we had... Um, we don't, have any, we don't have any family close by who can watch watch the kids, and we didn't have I mean, the circle of friends and babysitters that we currently have, so it was really hard to um, manage those days where you have a kid off from school. Um, so we kept I kept going to my boss and asking, you know, to rearrange these these schedules. And I think I felt um, I felt like I was asking too much. And I, and I was worried that I was just becoming annoying um, because I just kept asking over the things, okay, this schedule isn't working for the summer, let's try this. Um, okay, now the school year started again, let's try this. Um, and he would come back and say, no, this isn't working, let's, you know, I need you to try and be here during this time frame. Um, and it, just, it was a lot of back and forth sort of negotiating, trying to figure out what worked for me, what worked for him and the department. Um, but I mean, I, I guess it was good because he was open to it, um, and he was flex he was willing to keep. We kept, you know, kind of working on it until we got it right. Um, and I finally felt like I sort of hit like a really good sync with it all. Um, I had some, I had the, I had more flexibility now. I didn't have to really do the nine to five kind of thing. I could work from home some days. Um, and so things were finally sort of kind of evened out and really did well with sort of, my only problem was I was working from home and working too many hours. I was taking on too many tasks. So I'd work a full day in the office. I'd come home and work at night. I might work while I had a child home sick from school. I'd work from home. Um, but I was taking on too much, and I was working more than full time. Um, and then in June of... 2014, the last year, um, the day before my yearly evaluation interview with my new boss, um, I found out that I had breast cancer. So it was one of those things where I was talking to another coworker, a woman, and she said she she's been there a lot longer than I have. She's a little older than me, has a lot of experience, and she's really good at kind of understanding the um, sort of the emotional cultural barometer at work. And she said, you need to talk to your boss. She's like, you cannot go into him during your, your interview tomorrow and <laughs> drop that bomb on him. You need to give him a little heads up. Um, I was still sort of reeling from the bomb being dropped on me. Um, so, I, you know, I, he wasn't in the office. So I had to call him, and which, you know, was a very cheerful uh, conversation. Um, but it was one of those things sort of walking into the my evaluation the next day where we talked about sort of last year's accomplishments and what the goals were for the next year and realizing I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, and we both sort of had this, this sort of like, well, let's just take it as it comes and I had to sort of figure out, because we didn't know whether I'd be able to work while going through cancer treatment. Um, but it was a very, again, he was very willing to sort of, we were going to go back and forth, work, talk, um, 
you know, find out something that works. And I tried to work through part of chemo and got to the point where I was too exhausted. I couldn't, um, I put in maybe a month during chemo. Yeah. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so came back after chemo. Um, so I, I went on disability for a while. I came back. And I basically, my whole life changed, my whole attitude about working. Um, before, I had a lot of guilt. I had guilt at work about not being home with the kids. At, when I was home with the kids, I had guilt because I was logging into work, you know, in the evenings. Um, so there was a lot, of, I had just a lot of guilt. Um, now, post-cancer, there is no guilt. I don't care. <laughs> I, I still want to do my job and do it well, but I don't. I don't worry about it. I don't have the guilt. And I, my feeling, too, is if it's not working, you know, I just keep, I told my boss when I came back, I don't want to work full-time anymore. Um, I work, so I have a part-time schedule. And, and during that time, too, while I was out, she got promoted and I got a new boss. But then to three, three different bosses. My new boss, um, he understands flex time a little bit more and has been much easier to work with. And he doesn't even work in my office. In, the, in our Philadelphia location. So he's in a different office, and I'm doing work for offices in two other states. So there's this the whole work has changed. The stuff that I'm doing has changed. Um, and they, they gave me stuff that was, that they sort of moved me in the position knowing that it would be more flexible time-wise. Um, and so it all kind of worked out. And I'm much happier now. I'm where, before, it's sort of like my life is divided into pre-cancer and post-cancer. Um, before cancer, I was on this path working with Jessica, wanting my life to have more balance, wanting to have more time for my family, but I had a lot of fear about being able to ask and be able to push for what I wanted and a lot of guilt. And now I don't have, I don't have any guilt. I don't have any fear. Um, and it's, um, life is where I want it to be wish I hadn't had to go through cancer to get there. <laughs> so that, wow. in a nutshell, is sort of my story. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank you, Kate. And, um, you know, one of the things, I'm going to be putting up slides throughout our conversation today to remind people that there's a lot of resources that we have to help people think about these things. Um, and one of the things that Kate was talking about was that she was trying to figure out how to, what we call, redesign her work so that she had more time for these other activities um, and what she was struggling with was the one that is highlighted called workflow, which is the pace and quantity of work. And for many professional jobs, that's the one that gets to be challenging. Um, but what I hear in your story, Kate, is that you really uh, learned something about um, how to be more courageous from something that wasn't so much fun in your life. Um, and I think I can even be as bold to say it's not that your work suffered from you getting more clear. My guess is that, like I've seen with most people, there's a more clarity about, hey, there's only so many hours available for work. How do I work most effectively given the hours I have available? So has that been your experience, Kate, that you've just kind of learned better about how to be smart the time you have available for work? Yes. Um, one of the things I did when I came back, knowing that I wasn't going to be working 40 hours anymore or more than that, was I shed several of my duties. I um, was able to pass them off to some other people. Other ones I just decided we just weren't going to do anymore. Um, so part of it was just knowing, you know, you can't cram more work in. Um, it just doesn't work. So getting rid of certain duties, passing them on to other people. And then the other part was, was since sort of letting go of some of that stuff, I was able to focus more. And I saw also with my work style, um, I think you and I had talked before about chunking, which was you know, working on something for an hour and a half, not multitasking. It's also just sort of just general sort of you know, ways to work. Um, so yeah, it was, the big part was shedding responsibilities, realizing. And I think that was my problem before when I was working, trying to work part time. Um, when my kids were small and then trying to cram 40 hours of work into 30 hours um, and that didn't work. Yeah. And I don't know why I never realized that, oh, I should just get rid of some <laughs> responsibilities. 
um, I think it worked out fine. Yeah. And I think you're not alone with that. I mean, I, uh, again, there's some great stories on our website of a guy who went from a, a, a five-day work week to a four-day work week. And again, it's talking exactly about what Kate's talking about, which is, you know, trying to cram five days of work into four days of work doesn't really um, do anybody any good. So when you read CJ's case study, you'll see how he kind of really thought about how do I be smart about what I should be working on. And, and sometimes it meant that, you know, uh, you just had you and your boss work together to, to prioritize things, what you did have time to do and what you didn't have time to do. And that's a really good conversation for employees and bosses to have because there is limited amount of resource. You can't get everything done. And so you get smarter and smarter about how to use the time well. I hear one other story, that I, a theme, that I think we'll probably hear in Michelle's story too, is this story of changing bosses. Um, in your case, it sounds like you had some changes and ultimately have someone who has more understanding and, um, about how Flex can work, and that's made it better too. Yeah, I mean, I've gone with three bosses in 11 years, um, and they all had a different way of working and a different way that they wanted me to work. Um, and we've managed to, all, you know, between all of them, have managed to um, find routines and, and ways of working that, you know, I was able to get some of what I wanted as far as flex time goes. But my newer boss, um, my most recent boss, he, I think he gets it. Um, in a way that my other bosses, you know, weren't totally on board with. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's something that's going to really come out in today's conversation too, is that as we have more people who've kind of uh, had some success around flexing and moved into positions of leadership, um, that it ends up helping more people successfully flex around them. Uh, so wonderful, Kate. And it sounds like one of the things that you also learned most recently was how it helped to make your schedule kind of transparent to other people. Is that something that you learned as well? Oh, yes. Um, a couple weeks ago, some people had, um, had said, oh, I thought you'd come back to work full time. I was looking for you. I, my, I have a current schedule where I'm in the office certain days of the week and I work from home other days of the week. Um, and they said, oh, I thought you'd come back full time already. And I said, no, I'm, I said, I'm not. I don't ever plan on coming back full time. Um, so I just posted my schedule and let everybody know what it was. And that transparency helps. And it means that on days when I'm not in the office, people feel more comfortable reaching out to me, whereas before they were kind of hesitant, like, should I call her? Should I not call her? Should I email? You know. So now it, it, it definitely the transparency um, helps. A lot. I think when you make it secretive, um, it makes it feel like it's not fair. Yeah. Because uh, some employees may want flexibility and they don't know how to ask for it or they can't, depending on what their job is. Um, so having the transparency makes it seem fair and and that it's approved and and approved by you know the administration. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that's a great lead into Michelle Hickox, who really has been a pioneer in trying to uh, think about how to do work differently throughout her career. Um, and I know her story well. We're going to hear a little bit about Michelle's story, um, but also what we're going to get a chance to do is talk about how now Michelle, as a leader, is making a difference as well. Uh, so Michelle, you were hearing a young parent uh, managing some of the things that you figured out many years ago. What what sounds familiar? How do, what are what's a quick overview of how you did things like this in your life? Oh wow! It's, uh, Amy and I both were sitting here saying, you know, all of that sounded really familiar to both of us. And uh, I wouldn't say I have it all figured out. I keep I keep trying to get it figured out, but um, I did learn a lot of things over my career when I was at uh, McLadry. I was in public accounting, and um, you know, the, the public accounting firms now have all, I think, done a pretty good job of establishing programs for flex time and flex year and all the different things that they call it. But in 2001, when our firm was sold to McGladry, um, I had kids that were, uh, my daughter was about to be, um, she finished kindergarten, um, and then I had a younger daughter who's two years younger. And I really, um, when I was a kid, my parents were teachers, and I really didn't want her to have to go to daycare full time during the summer. So I, unfortunately, it made business sense too because, um, you know, our work there is very seasonal and I really didn't have a very 
high chargeable load during the summer. But the managing partner of the Dallas office had never really seen that. He wasn't sure how it would work. He he didn't he, again you kind of get back to the question about fairness. And he he reluctantly agreed because I had support from another partner who really wanted to retain me. He wanted me to stay and be happy. He agreed to let me do it, but he didn't want me to tell anyone that I was doing it. And so we tried that. I tried it for about a year and I actually almost gave up on it because, um, as Kate said, it, it's very difficult. You know, when part of my agreement, too, was during the fall that I would, I would be out of the office by 4 o'clock. And, you know, I would get comments from people as I would be getting on the elevator of like, wow, what do you, you're getting out here early today or what are you doing? Or, you know, and, and I really, you know, I really couldn't tell them what I was doing. And so I learned very quickly that had to change. And so it, once it became a lot more transparent with the people that reported to me, the people I reported to, and clients, you know, in a client service industry, I had to be clear with clients. So I started communicating to my clients when I was in the office, when I was not going to be in the office, and, and then gave them different avenues to be able to get the information that they, if they, that they needed, either delegate it to another employee, delegate it to my assistant. Uh, my assistant became a really great tool to use in developing my flexibility. Um, and so I was able to be uh, very successful. I made partner at McGlidery during the time that I was on that schedule and then stayed there through 2011 when I uh, took the position here as the CFO of Independent Bank. And, and what's amazing is what we're going to start also hearing is not only was Michelle a trailblazer on setting these things up for her own life, uh, but now where she is today, she's been able to kind of bring that expertise of how Flex can work um, into her organization. Um, one of the things that we've really spent some time learning from people like Michelle is that there really are some skills these integrated professionals or integrated leaders are using. Um, and, you know, we time and time again, what we found was that it wasn't that Michelle uh, wanted to do her job poorly when she did it differently. She just wanted to figure out how to do it differently. So, Michelle, can you share a little bit about, you know, were there some examples about how your workplace gained from you changing things around so that you had uh, time for your life but also time to do a good job at work? Um, well, you know, as we as I mentioned just a little bit ago, because of the seasonality of the work, you know, I did, I went to a part-time schedule, so my compensation was reduced um, given the time frame of when our heaviest workload occurred. I did work what I would call normal hours during our busy season, but some of the other benefits I don't think people think about are I learned to better delegate. And so I had a I had a couple of people you know below me that were able to get promoted up to the director level that you know I had clients that were had confidence that if they needed information or something from me they could also get it from uh, one of my colleagues and so able to grow people into other positions I think that was probably one of the benefits that nobody really thought about in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So and it looks like I have a little. Uh, background noise from somebody that I can't mute. So there we go. I'm right now. Um, so that's a great number of examples of how it really benefited uh, you, benefited your organization. And here's the extra super bonus point. I'm going to actually put up Amy's picture now because Amy's really seen, as best I understand, uh, she's seen a before and after of having Michelle join Independent Bank. Um, and so I'm going to start by having Amy talk a little bit about, you know, what has this meant to you to have someone who's had uh, more experience around flexibility come in and play a role in your organization uh, to support more flexibility? What's your experience been that, around that, Amy, and how has Flex set up in your life? Um, well, it's been great. Um, before Michelle, I've been with the bank for 10 years, and before Michelle came, um, I only had one child, and she was she was about three, and so I wasn't quite into that, you know, she's in school and she has sports and, you know, her schedule wasn't as, as crazy as it is now. And so having Michelle, I've learned a lot about delegating. I've learned a lot about um, setting priorities and that 
it's okay to set priorities. I think um, the the management structure that I was under before was always very supportive of a family and very encouraging and you know that kind of thing. But but not as not as promoting, I would say, of time off, time away from the office. Um, when you were away from the office, it was kind of an unwritten rule that you needed to be accessible at all times. Um, and you know, I was I was still young in my career, and so that was all I knew. Um, so when Michelle came, and you know, she's telling us it's okay to turn your BlackBerry off on the weekend, and you know, you don't have to answer those emails until Monday morning. It, it was a culture shock for me at first. Um, but, you know, ultimately for me, I now have two children. It's, it's been great. I've, um, I feel like I'm a better mom because of it. But I also feel like as I was growing into a management role, having seen, um, seen two different styles of management in that respect and, and the impact that they had on me as a parent and, and as an employee, um, I knew how I wanted my employees to feel and the flexibility that I enjoyed that I wanted to be able to give to them. Um, and having a manager like Michelle made it that much easier for me to give that to my team. So it, it's been a great experience for me so yeah, far. That's wonderful. And I'm going to put up a slide that's a little complicated, but I hope it illustrates a really important point. So we've been working with these pretty impressive leaders who've followed these integrated career paths. And what this slide is trying to show us is that some people enter the workforce at that entry level and they like what Amy said, who kind of put work first because they're at a, a starting point in their career, they don't have some other responsibilities, and then they move ahead into a mid-level position. Um, and when they have an experience of working with somebody who supports them to work flexibly, they learn integration skills. So that's what those purple people are. They're people who have learned how to kind of figure out how to do work effectively, prioritize work, be strategically accessible. And then what we're seeing with somebody like Michelle, when they move to the very top of the organization, even more change can happen. The organization can then start thinking about, you know, how do we want to handle parental leave? How do we want to handle work from home? Um, and actually, Michelle has a pretty cool story about how she made some changes so that people could work from home who traditionally couldn't work from home. So we're seeing that as we really support professionals to follow an integrated career path, yes, they're moving up, and, and that's a good thing, but they're also influencing downwards and creating and supporting flexibility. So Michelle, you've had some experience around this for a while. What are some insights you've seen about how you've been able to use your role uh, at Independent Bank to help promote more flexibility. Is there one story that comes to mind of, of how you've really been able to support more flexibility? Uh, I don't know that I have one specific story, Jessica, but I'll say even in my role, you know, I came in, I came to the bank in a leadership position. I joined the executive leadership team, and and I think I told you even in the beginning, it felt really strange to me because it seemed like there was a pretty inflexible culture in place here and that um, and what knowing what I know now I'm not really sure where that where that came from because I'm convinced now it really wasn't related to the CEO although I think I had the impression in the beginning that it did uh, but what I found out was that um, we'll specifically talk about our ma maternity leave policy um, the bank didn't have one, or the bank didn't have a paid maternity leave policy. And last year, we were in the process of looking at benefits, and our HR group, you know, brought forth some recommended benefits that we should add. And maternity leave was not on that list. And I had previously brought it up with a couple of other people, and it really didn't get very far. But I'd never asked the CEO about it. And so in this discussion, I brought it up. I said, you know, why? why don't we consider adding maternity leave? You know, other companies are doing that. I think we're getting bigger. Um, it, it's a good benefit, I think, for our people. And, you know, there were a couple of people that were not real sure about it. Uh, but the CEO was, I mean, he was like, you know, I didn't even realize we didn't have a maternity leave policy. <laughs> I mean, that was his words. And so I would say one of the things I found out there is that, 
you know, sometimes I don't always know what I think I know, and so if you really see a disservice or something that needs to change, you really need to speak up. Um, and I think of all the benefits that were rolled out last year in that rollout, I think that's been the most well received. Um, definitely. Anyway. Yeah. And, and what a great example, Michelle, of a courageous conversation you had, actually, um, because, again, it's speaking up at every level um, and influencing where you can at every level to keep on improving flexibility for a wider circle of people. Um, wonderful. And what it also helps us illustrate is uh, something we've learned a long time ago at Third Path. I'll put up one more slide, and then I'm going to get Leslie to share a thought or two. What we've learned to create a more flexible workplace, it actually requires um, th a kind of three-pronged approach. We need individuals to learn how to manage flexible solutions better. We need teams to learn how to work together to manage flexibility so it works for everybody on the team. And we need top leaders to be advocates and role models uh, to promote more flexibility. So Leslie, you've been listening to people, stories about how they've kind of put flexibility into their lives and made things happen. Uh, what would you like to add that you see either a role that you've played or Michelle's played in helping there be more flexibility at Independent Bank? What are your thoughts, Leslie? Um, okay, um, just a little background here. I previously worked with Michelle at McGladry, so when she um, asked me to apply for the job that I have now at the bank, of course it was a no-brainer um, for me. Um, and coming from McGladry, you know, there not being a lot of flexibility in my position. I mean, not that it wasn't offered, just something I wasn't taking advantage of at that time. Um, you know, here, when I came to the bank, I started a family, which has been the biggest part that Michelle has been supportive of. Um, you know, just at first, you know, I felt very uncomfortable saying, hey, Michelle, you know, my daughter's sick. I've got to stay at home today. And she's really supported that. I mean, she understands. She's been there. So that was very helpful. And it really, really reduces your stress when, you know, you don't have you, – you don't have to have those difficult conversations and feel bad about it. And it kind of goes back to what Amy said, setting priorities. I mean, you got to do what you got to do um, for your family. And just having Michelle's support was was really helpful um, on that for that. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think what we're seeing it's that concept that because we have somebody who's kind of laid the road work, groundwork for how to do this differently and modeled it for others, there's a safety to talk about things um, and to figure things out as you go. Um, because as time goes on, we all go through changes in our families. Um, and I was talking to Andy Agnew, who works with me, about um, some of these ideas because we don't want to misconstrue that suddenly you get to nirvana and organizations have it all figured out, and they never have to figure out anything else about flexibility. Because even in a really flexible workplace, like Third Path Institute, we've had to figure out a couple of things. So we wanted to take a minute to share a couple of our insights um, running a very flexible workplace, and how every year, every six months, every week, there's always some more things that we learn together. Um, so Andy and I agreed that we'd share a couple of stories. One of them is kind of comical, um, but uh, hard, too. Um, the, why it's comical is I'll put up a slide that's very similar to what Leslie was talking about. Over time, we go through stages, many of us, if we have children. Uh, we have early career when, before kids, and then we kind of go through the new family stage with young kids, and then school-age care, and that changes what our needs are. Well, I had gotten to... Uh, what was about to be empty nest uh, stage in my life, I thought. My son went off to college, and uh, I thought that that meant that I was going to be sitting home at, and eating bonbons in the evening because there was nothing else I had to do. But instead, uh, what I suddenly realized was that we really were dealing with some serious elder care issues very unexpectedly. And why do I bring this up? 
Well, what I learned, again, every year we learn something new at Third Path, is that for me, I suddenly, unexpectedly, couldn't get all the work I needed to get done this fall. There really was no question between the elder care responsibilities and what was on my plate at work. I couldn't get them both done. And so what I had done over the years, though, is created a lot of transparency in my team to talk about these things. And I had to create a group of people who I could call and get support to think about these things. And between talking to my team and talking to some of my friends for support, I really was able to, again, there's that word, prioritize. I was able to say to myself, I can't get all this work done. What can I put on hold while I handle this elder care responsibilities? So I took individual responsibility to think about what I could do to make it work, but then I talked to my team. And I said to them, you know what? This is gonna be a really different fall than I expected. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna to have to approach it from the point of view of what's urgent, what's time sensitive, and I'll get to those things, but please, I'm gonna need your help. If I'm forgetting something, if I'm dropping the ball, I need your help um, because I'm a little overwhelmed dealing with this very unexpected elder care issue. And I think what that did for my team, we've done it before, it really role models that life is, can throw us some unexpected curveballs and we can work together to think about how to best manage them. And so we've created a, a, a workplace where there's transparency and support to kind of deal with the latest thing that's come our way. And I feel like that was a big lesson because I really thought it was going to be a very, very different fall. Uh, where I had lots of time to get a bunch of new and exciting projects done, but that just wasn't going to be the case. Andy, what was it like to have me call up and talk a little bit about that I'm, you know, suddenly dealing with some unexpected elder care issues? And then we had a, a, a story we were going to share that Andy's, uh, Andy and I worked on together, too. What was it like to have me call you up and, and, and Bonnie and talk about how I was suddenly was dealing with elder care? Um, well, I think, first of all, it was a shock uh, <laughs> to have to suddenly say, you know, oh, um, hi, I've got a problem, and yep. then it's kind of like, oh, wow, that's a that's such an extensive problem, and it's such a curveball. Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, so now we have to, you know, we've got a plan of what we were going to do. <laughs> now we have to refigure that. We have to sit down and say, okay, how do we um, work this through so that, you do have the time to do the most important work, and you have time for um, the, the family issues that you need to take care of. Uh, and I think that was the, the, the key point about it, was that we worked it together. Yeah. Um, that as a team, we worked out what was going to be the most important work, and what could we, uh, as team members, take from you to be able to lessen the load, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, uh, those of you who know me, I'm someone who's pr pretty much wears my emotions on my sleeve. So it also includes a, a phone call or here or there where Andy really just listened to me. I couldn't separate uh, work and family so easily and, and that there were some tears and some sadness around what I was going through um, and some need to hear from Andy about he'd had some experiences around some of this before. So there was need um, to kind of relate at a very human level about what I was going through and to reach out to Andy and get some support around that. And I think that's just the truth of today's workplace. If we're going to create a flexible workplace that really supports people to have lives, this fall was an example where sometimes life does intrude on work a little bit. And um, I think that's just going to be the case once in a while. But we came up with a good answer about how to best manage it. Well, with the eye on one clock, we had one more story that I think was a really kind of story that applies to a lot of people. They can think about this one as well. When Andy and I were preparing for this call, I talked to him about something last fall, last winter that happened where we had a lot of snow days. And you'll hear from Andy that he's the primary parent in his household and takes care of his school age kids after school. And Andy and I had to learn together about, well, what does it mean when we suddenly have a lot of snow days? Um, and your home and your kids are home. How do we want to make it work for you and for work? Andy, tell us a little bit about how you've organized family in your life and what your memory of those conversations is about how to, those courageous conversations we had together about how to best manage snow days. Yeah, sure, no problem. I mean, I've worked with Jess now for, uh, can you believe it, Jess, five years. <laughs> and um, 
for, I've been a primary parent um, for many, many years now. My wife works for a, she has a senior role in a pharma company, and that often involves her uh, taking uh, significant time out for international travel. And it isn't always a case of that being, you know, um, <laughs> well planned, shall we say. Sometimes it's, um, hey, you know, I've got to go next week and I'm going to be gone for th two weeks. And um, in the early days, that could be a problem because, you know, I was the primary parent with two young kids. Uh, they're less young now. I've got two teenage boys. And the issues are, are different, as I think Jess was indicating earlier on. It's as you move through uh, life, um, the, the, the ages of your kids um, it impacts differently on how you have to uh, manage work and life, I guess. And so um, working with Jess, uh, the, the, the flexibility of my role is, is key to me because whilst my children are you know, teenagers and they, they need you less, but they need you differently as well, I've found over the years. And so for me, it's important to be present uh, in their lives and a, and a constant presence as well. So you might not be needed as, as, as much, but it's still good, at least from, from my perspective, I, I don't know about them, but from my perspective, I feel like I'm contributing uh, an important aspect in their lives by being a constant presence. And one of the conversations Jess and I have had in, in, in the past revolved around these inconvenient snow days, especially inconvenient multiple snow days, where it, it can literally throw a spanner in your works, as it were, in terms of you've got your plan about how you're going to do your work week, what are your most important tasks, what's got to be um, focused work, and then suddenly a snow day comes along and you have to somehow manage to balance the work and the family commitments, often at short notice. And Jess and I had some um, interesting conversations around that issue in order to say that, you know, actually it's okay for you to say, hey, you know what, today's just not going to work in terms of what I had planned. So I need to do just the the minimum that I can get done today, because it's a snow day, but I need to refocus my focused work time to a different point in the day. So it may be that I don't do that important focused work today in the afternoon when I would have planned to do it, but I need to do other things and I'll get to that this evening when the kids are doing different things and I'm no longer required to be around. Or it may be that I choose to do it on a different day um, because, for example, I, I don't work Wednesdays and sometimes in the past when we've had these snow days, I've had to not work as, uh, as, as many hours on a, a normal work day and move those hours to a Wednesday when I'm normally not working at all. And I think the important thing about that is, is not that, hey, aren't we clever, we did that. It's more a question of, hey, you know, we weren't afraid to sit down and have the conversation about it and work a solution that was good for me, good for Jess, and good for Third Path at the same time. Yeah, it's a great example of what I say people need to look for, a triple win solution, meaning when we encourage people to think about how to redesign their work, we encourage them to look for solutions that are good for getting the work done, good for the employee, and good for the uh, employee's team members or clients. So that's great. Well, thank you. So there's a lot of themes that have been surfaced today, and we're going to have a little time to talk about some of those themes. One of them is that, you know, our lives change over time. Um, and I was thinking, Kate, as I listened to your story, you know, we have to add another thing to this picture because... Yes, elder care is unexpected and can happen at any point in time, um, but the truth is we can also have some other serious illness for ourselves or somebody in our family that needs attention, not just elder care. Uh, so caregiving in general of somebody. And so we've probably heard some themes that are um, pretty obvious. And then what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about, you know, what are the themes did we hear 
Um, maybe since Kate, you've been doing a good job listening to some of these uh, different conversations, maybe there's something that you heard that really feels like it's um, a theme that's worth repeating that seems to make this all work better or be one of the challenges we have to overcome. So I'll start with Kate. And then I'll just check with Michelle, too, if she sees any themes that are worth repeating um, that we've heard in this idea that, yes, we need to have these conversations at the workplace. Yes, sometimes it takes a little courage to have this conversation. But when we have that conversation, it seems to improve things for ourselves and our workplaces. Kate, any extra themes you've heard that you think are worth underscoring? Well, it's funny because we all came to this flexible arrangement because of children. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's one of the things that came out of my situation at work as sort of being a total guinea pig is there's been more people at my workplace trying to get flexible arrangements. Um, and several of them are people who, who don't have kids. They want a, um, some flexibility for other interests in their lives. I think that's really important, too. It doesn't have to be about um, needing to care for um, child or care for a, um, an aging parent. Um, I think that's one of the things I, I found sort of interesting about the call. Yes, yes. In fact, I would argue what happens with families is because we have kids for so long, we just like your story shared, you get to try it, it doesn't work, try it again, it doesn't work. So that act of con um, having children for many years allows us to keep on experimenting, not giving up, trying again, and that's in some ways, that's how we've developed those integration skills or the 21st century skills we see those leaders using. Wonderful point, though. This is an everyone issue. Um, and I have a great story I'll share about th that if we have time. Michelle, any thoughts that come to your mind as you've listened to some of the, the stories, some themes, something you want to underscore? And then I'll check with Amy and then Leslie. Uh, no, the one of the things I wanted to say, though, is that I think you know, we talk about flexibility and how great it is, but, you know, the thing that we sometimes don't talk about is, is even though we want to provide that, you know, these these two women that report to me, they still have jobs to do. So yep. we still have to be creative in making sure there are ways that they are able to do their jobs and maintain their flexibility. Um, I thought maybe Leslie might point out, you know, when after she had Avery, her baby, um, she doesn't live as close to the corporate office as the, those of us over here, and so we were able to design, um, add an office for her in one of our branch locations that's much closer to her house, you know, where she's still able to, unfortunately for her, she's the only one in her department, and so <laughs> um, for, especially at quarter end, it's very important for her to stuff to get done, but we were able to reduce her commute um, significantly by being able to do that. So I think sometimes people, want to think about flexibility because it does require more work and more thought at times. I think it makes it a little more difficult at times to supervise people. Um, you know, we had a situation recently where, you know, we had some people in our group that maybe were not performing like they should have been and there, one of our managers tended to want to reduce the flexibility for the whole group as opposed to just taking it up with that one person because I think that's easier at times. And so it does require a little more work um, in a supervisory position, I think. Yeah, yeah, it does. And thank you for emphasizing both those points. We, the, when, we, when we develop these solutions, we've got to make sure the business is exceeding, when we, whatever solution it is, because that's what it's all about. Um, and to not lump people together, uh, but to look at a performance problem as a performance problem, not necessarily a flexibility problem for the whole team. Wonderful. Amy, there might be one last thought you want to add, nothing required, and then I'll check with Leslie. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's just learning that flexibility looks different for everyone. Um, and, you know, while flexibility for me might come in the form of time and being able to leave early or work from home on some days when my kids don't have school, you know, for some of my employees who are in a little bit of a different situation, it's flexible, they might be working more hours just at different times or, um, you know, the type of work that they do or something like that because everybody's situation is different. While I have a very supportive spouse at home and, and we're able to be flexible as a team, we have others that, you know, don't have that at home, you know, maybe a single parent or something like that. So flexibility is going to look different to those people, 
than it does for me. And and managing that and, and keeping that in mind, I think, has been has been really key for us. Wonderful point. Thank you so much. Leslie, just keeping one eye on the clock, there might be one more thought you want to share before we open it up for questions. Um, I don't really have anything specific. Um, kind of just adding on to what Amy just said, um, I think it is very helpful. Um, in addition to your work family being supportive, I think um, at home, your family family, uh, my husband and I have become more where we, you know, talk more about scheduling and who's going to pick up, who's going to drop off, that type of thing. You know, when when our daughter is sick, we kind of take turns, um, you know, scheduling who's who's really busy at work and you know, kind of working together um, to you know to be able to stay at home with her. Um, so I think it does take both the work side and the family side that has to be supportive of the situation. What a wonderful point, Leslie. Thank you so much. In fact, I find, um, and Michelle, I'm going to ask you if you agree with this, that by having um, in a two-parent household, both parents, quote unquote, get on the same page around their work and life goals, it sometimes gives us the courage we need to make that change at work. Has that been your experience, Michelle, before we end the call? I'm just wondering. Well, you, you know the answer, Jessica. I mean, Rob and I had that conversation before I decided to pursue being a partner at McGladry. So we started that process pretty early. And um, I think it overall made our lives, I think everything uh, go much better when we had a plan together. Yeah, yeah. really makes a big difference. I think it, it, it helps us. Uh, have that courage to figure out the next step we need to make. Um, so I hope everybody listening today has really heard that you, it might take some work or as in Kate's story showed us, it might take some work for multiple years to figure it out. But the act of um, keeping on working at it, we will find those answers uh, to really put flexibility in place, you know, no matter what the organization is like. And so what we're going to do next is ask them open it up for some questions, but before we do that, I'll end the recording for today's call.